Okay, Representative Gobbler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity to hear um, from you about how this report came together. I'm in my sixth term in the legislature. I'm one of the guys that uh, the chairman referred to as one of the new members here. I asked to join this committee, um, and, and some of you may know I also serve in the National Guard. I'm in the Army. but uh, So I actually asked to join this committee because of the emergency services side of it, and specifically this conversation that's been going on. Uh, the conversation I've been having in my legislative district is, um, is, is very much at a fever pitch because I have a, a huge concern in my legislative district about the future of where we're going to find the people to respond when, when the alarm goes off. And, uh, and so I found, found this conversation very interesting, and I just wanted to uh, kind of focus this down a little bit because I think that we have two very um, different and perhaps equally valid versions of reality being discussed, but I think that the that the task we have in front of us is how do we put those two versions of reality together. On one hand, you've got the question of what sort of training does it take to respond to an emergency? And then on the other hand, what sort of resources in the forms of human beings do we have in the state and how many hours do they have in their life that they can invest before they fall off and say, you know what, I'm gonna go do something else. And what we're dealing with right now is we're seeing the increase in the amount of line of duty deaths because we have more and more people that are staying in the active field service to a greater and greater age because there simply aren't the number of young people coming in behind them that are getting the certifications they need and able to, to show up on the scene. So I'm trying to figure out what can I do to go back to my fire chiefs and give them um, some tools that they can use to bring people into the fire service. Um, just a, a few thoughts I wanted to, to share here. One, I think Senator Hutchinson made an excellent point um, when he was talking about the idea of modules. And I understand there are, there are differences as far as what level of training we want people to get to, but by offering the option of, of modules in training, I think what we're telling people is they can eat the apple one bite at a time instead of having to swallow the whole thing down their throat in, in one gulp. Um, and I certainly know that if I'm trying to, to recruit somebody to come and, and take, take part in an organization, if I tell them, before you can show up on the scene, I'm gonna have to send you 56 miles away every weekend for the next two knows how many weekends, it's gonna be 188 hours, but the clock doesn't start until you get there and get in your seat. Um, how many of those people are going to be able to follow that through before they show up and then start relieving our folks that have been in the fire service for 40, 50, 55 years plus from the responsibility of showing up to every single motor vehicle accident, every single um, emergency that might exist in our community. So uh, I think the question I have is how can we put the two things together? I see the recruitment and retention subcommittee saying one thing and the training and operations subcommittee saying another thing. How do we put this together so we can make it user friendly so that the 21st century uh, emergency services force can actually come together in a world of reality that, that fits together? The entry level fire training program for the fire service is already in four modules. It's been in four modules, I don't know. About 12 years. Yeah, probably. And, and what does module one? Uh, module what? one module one is 16 hours long. It's the introduct in introduction to safety and training, basically. And, and what does that get somebody in their ability to participate in a fire department? But basically, it is how can you get on a fire truck and ride the fire truck safely without being a danger to yourself or someone else around you? The second module, and now you're going to test my memory here. The second module is uh, fire ground. Fire ground, so, yeah, fire ground support. Mm -hmm. It's the second module is fire ground support. It's like uh, 24, 28 hours. I don't remember the exact hours. But, and then the third module was exterior firefighting. The fourth module was interior firefighting. And the reason that when I was the fire commission, we put it in the modules is to try to do exactly what you wanted. First of all, we gave the fire chief the opportunity that if the guy down the street came to the fire and said, I want to be a volunteer, but I don't ever want to go inside, in fact, I don't even want to squirt water on the outside. I want to be a gopher for you on the fire ground. Then I, as the fire chief, could say, you take the first and second module, and I'm satisfied with the level of training that you've received from the state. 
If I show up and say, I want to be someone that squirts water from the outside and do stuff on the outside of the building, okay, I want you as a fire chief, you take module one, two, and three. And you didn't have to take the apple at one time. I could do the first module this month, maybe we take a break. A month later, we do the second module. A month later, maybe the third module. And then if you have the guy that shows up or the gal that shows up and says, I want to go inside, I want to be on the nozzle, then okay, as the fire chief, I make the decision, you go for, through all four modules. And oh, by the way, I want you to take a 16 hour structural burn class as well. Or you could have the other occur, the fire chief could say, don't worry about the training. Here's your pager. Here's the key to the door. When the pager goes off, you come a running. The guy walked in the firehouse, couldn't spell firefighter, and now he just left and he is one without any training whatsoever. And we have both dynamics at work in the Commonwealth. We have fire departments that require you to be certified at firefighter one before you're allowed to ride the fire truck. Another dynamic that we have going on, when I started in the fire service, for the first two or three years I was in the firehouse, I never met a state instructor. I was taught what I was taught by the fire chief and the senior men in the fire station. Any more what happens is, is that you join, you got to take a state class. Training within firehouses in so many communities anymore just doesn't occur. The fire chief doesn't do training. The senior people don't do training. We depend on the local level training system for the people to get their training. Uh, and, you know, I, and then when I, they finally say, hey, we have a state instructor coming to teach this class. I was like, oh my God, there's a state instructor coming to our class. I couldn't believe it. Uh, so it's already in a, in a module format. Part of the problem is a lot of our fire chiefs don't understand that. And, and I think that, that is a, is a, is a well-taken point. I think that the question the question that I have is it, it does not it does not appear that that module system is is being used to the fullest extent that it could be, and I think that part of it might be on the back end as well. I hear a lot from my chiefs that they're also very worried about the the liability one the liability that it places on them as far as um, uh, the only thing that we seem to be able to conceive of. From, from a big picture perspective is do they have firefighter one or not, whereas I think those modules do make sense. And having somebody that is, that is module one, module two, module three qualified um, makes a lot of sense to, to be able to have them stay within their capacity. And also, they're also going to gain a lot of experience from, from being able to work within that capacity before they go on to the next level. Um, but then the other side of it is also some of the, um, the red tape that we have in, in some of the um, – uh, in, in some of the financing, whether it be loans, grants, or otherwise, we, we grade a fire department on what percentage of their firefighters are firefighter one, not module one, module two, in progress, module three. Could, could you comment at all on whether it would my be... Fault. That's my fault. When I was the fire commissioner, we started the grant program. I was told by members of the General Assembly administration at the time, we do not want this to be a handout like it's been in the past. Because in the past, when we had the first grant program, you all recall, we took the money, we divided it by a number of fire departments, and everybody got an equal share. When we finally got permanent funding, we had to come up with some way to incentivize the program. So everybody gets a grant, but those who have people who are certified to Firefighter 1 get a point. And they, you, when I was a fire commissioner, it was up to 10 points. Now I believe it's up to 20 points. The more points you got, the more money you get out of the grant program. So the individual that doesn't have anybody certified gets probably ten dollars or $11,000, while the individual that has 20 people certified might be, get $14,000 in the grant program. So, and, and the interesting thing was, the first, after the first two years we did that, the number of people that certified to Firefighter 1 in the first two years we did that, and those first two years exceeded the total number of people that had certified at Firefighter 1 five years previous to that. So did the incentive work? I'd have to say it did. There's some uh, right. comments. But everybody got a grant. Nobody was excluded. Representative, uh, the, being a former fire chief, the liability... I was concerned about was not having that training for my people. If my people didn't have that firefighter one and they got hurt, guess who they were coming after? They were coming after me, okay? When they would have known that if I just would have done the essentials program for them, 
which basically is you show up, you may take a test, you may not. It's, it's a certificate of attendance. In the Firefighter 1, not only are they showing off their skills that they can do it, they're also taking a written examination. It's, uh, it's like the Mr. Man said, you know, I can't spell firefighter, but I am one now. Uh, would you tell you what? We'll just hand you a helmet and a rifle in the uh, National Guard. It, it, it's the same thing. We need to get past that. We drew the line that firefighter one was the minimum certification. You know, in addition to firefighter one, there's firefighter two. Uh, there's the hazmat that goes on with this. This is not a hobby anymore, okay? This isn't coming down to the firehouse and donating time. This is... And, and is, sir, I, I think a, that's the... It is the, a vocation. And, and I think that's the problem, is, is trying to put... And, and I agree with you. I think that the goal is to have as highly trained and as well staffed of, of an emergency service as we can, I think the question comes down to if if we let the perfect be the enemy of the good, we're going to end up running out of volunteers and we're going to have 70, 80, 90 year old volunteers are going to be our only folks well, left. Well, that's not going to work either. And that's obviously. not going to work either. And, and we're going to have people, more and more people having heart attacks on the scene because they can't lift the jaws of life. And as Mr. Genoway said in his testimony, you know, it, it, it's, I, I told you I, I follow social media really good. You know what? Over this past weekend, it sickened me to see a fire department pull its trucks out onto the apron, set up a makeshift kitchen inside where the bays, which probably if that would have happened in my community, the public health would have shut them down. And they're selling food to keep the lights on. So what is that telling me? It's telling me that, you know what, the community doesn't really care. All they want is they don't want a tax increase. Uh, when was the last time you saw a police officer hold bingo to buy bullets? Okay? How about the public works department ha have a, uh, s sell raffle tickets to buy a snowplow? We don't do that, but for some reason, it's okay for us that we're the insurance for the community, and we have to beg to keep, keep the doors open, and again, Coming from a third-class city and a career service, it's the same thing. Well, we don't have that as many fires as we did. Well, you know why we don't have as many fires? Because we, because this chief pushed fire prevention and getting the message out. And before I finish, I'm going to pass it along to my uh, cohort here, who has something to say. Thank you, uh, Jay Delaney, Wilkesbury, and I'm president of the Pennsylvania Career Fire Chiefs Association. And you know, we, we talked here for about the last 45 minutes about fires. That's what we talked about. 96% of what we do is not fight fires. 96%. When all of you go home tonight, get a salt shaker out, turn it upside down, and put some granules of salt on, on your, your table. And look at three of those granules. If that was fentanyl, we would die. I'm, we're in the risk management business. We're risk managers. When a firefighter gets killed in a fire, when NIOSH comes to investigate us, they don't ask you. The first thing they take is the training records, okay? If a firefighter goes out to a car accident and touches somebody who has hepatitis B or HIV and they have an open wound, they can get it, okay? When I first started in this business, I was 21 years old, okay? I didn't have gray hair. I was a fireman and I fought fires, but the nature of 911, whoever thought 343 firefighters in New York City in 2001 would have died because of jets crashing into buildings. We are your first line of defense in this Commonwealth, not the National Guard, not the Army, not the Marines. We go first, with all due respect to our armed services, God bless them, but these are the folks, if something bad happens in the city of Harrisburg, Police and fire are going to be the first ones there. If there's a white packet that comes here. But I ask you to think how we think in this risk management business. I wouldn't dare put a firefighter out there to respond to any type of an emergency without giving him the tools to do that job. And I think John Chief Bassett it well. Uh, it, the fire service, we're, we're, there's just an expectation that uh, we don't have to have any training. We're, we're just good. Well, you didn't have to have training 30 years ago. We did learn on the job, but, you know, all your children go get college educated today. They get educated to do their work. Why is it that we have, we don't have to have 
the knowledge to be able to do our job, but everyone else has to have knowledge of business to get by. So I just challenge you. What we talked about for 45 minutes was putting out fires, and guess what? 96% of what we do is not put fires out. So yes, bloodborne pathogens. Yes, we deal with, with, with fentanyl, carifentanyl, methyfentanyl, all of these things that I never would have thought in my career that I would have had to deal with. But I'm going to be damned if I'm not going to prepare my firefighters to have the tools to stay alive. Because when the NIOSH guy comes to my door and says, can I see what kind of training your firefighters had? You told them to go into that fire. Let, let's see what training you gave them. So my apologies for, for getting the emotional side of this. but. Um, um, we're, we're, we're kind of going in a direction I didn't think we should go. I worked for almost two years with this committee and 39 others, elected officials, to get to the point that we were hopeful the legislature would listen to, to what we all had to say. Uh, it's serious. We're in crisis mode. We're in the crisis. Until someone dials 911 and the fire engine or the ambulance don't respond, I don't think we'll see anything done. But the first time an ambulance can't get to a scene or a fire engine can't get there, then I think we'll, we'll see some action. I'm, I'm optimistic, but I will tell you, in 2003, we had an SR-60. If you look at that SR-60 report, 50% of what was in the, the SR-60 report, report never got done. And now we're back in the year 2019, and we want to recorrect what we could have corrected back in 2003. So that's why I'm just kind of troubled where, where we're going. But I'm also respectful to ask that you help us get to the next level to fix some of these things. And, and, and I really appreciate the chairman's indulgence, and I'm just going to wrap this up because I, I, I knew this would be a, a conversation that would generate some emotion. I think our goals are all the same. Our goal is to get to the point where we have the right people responding with the right training at the right time. And the question is, how do we navigate reality? And I think that's a follow-on conversation that we all need to have. I'm committed to it. I'm sitting here because I don't want to see us repeat the missed opportunities of the past. I also want to see us navigate to that sweet spot that, that marries the, the, what we can get done with, with reality and to figure out how that meets the, 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 the true uh, people that are, that are our front line. And, and, and you hit the nail on the head with that. The, the people that are our front line are the first responders that are in our communities, and we need to figure out what policies will actually work to put that next generation of first responders on the seat on uh, on the street uh, protecting our community so with that mr. chairman I appreciate it I apologize for uh, taking so long